Praise the Lord. Amen. God's unchanging hand. It's good that some things don't change. We're in a world of rapid change. Everything. Seem to be an acceleration of everything. But it's so wonderful to know there's some things don't change. Hallelujah. You may be seated. God bless you. I have a very special request tonight. Young man leaves Thursday for Sudan to open our school there. We put the school there. We brought students out into Egypt and into Jordan, put the school there. But the first time, that we've really had a school. This young man who is with us, that's a very difficult country. They don't think too highly of us there. They've been in the Civil War. They've killed thousands and thousands. It's a state of slavery, a little bit of everything. But he's going there, uh, leaving Thursday to begin the school. Has 30 pastors uh, that, that are there uh, ready for the school. And I just want you to really pray for the school, but pray for him that God will keep him. I talked to him this afternoon. He's very excited about going. He's just committed to God, live or die, whatever it takes. You know, I had a call from a uh, radio station in Beaumont, KLVI. It reaches all the way from the valley to Baton Rouge. It's a talk station, very powerful station. Uh, Limbaugh, all of them, Hannity, all of them are on there. And they... This one man that has an hour talk, he's local, he's more liberal than Ted Kennedy, but he heard that I had been to Iraq and he wanted me on there, so I was on with him for an hour. Uh, one, one hour, and we, he, he opened right up. He wanted to talk about some things, but the questions he asked just led for me uh, to preach the gospel. He, he, he wasn't too much in favor of that. He got very upset with me at one time, I think, but wasn't much to do. He opened the question. But he said to me, why did you go to Iraq? Well, you know, I, I don't know what he thought I went for. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I said, I went over there to preach the gospel. Got a student there trained uh, in Jordan in 1999. And I said, we've got 400 people. I said, God's come to that desert. I said, I know a lot of people don't believe we belong there. But I tell you, Pentecost has come to that desert. Well, when he got in, he said, you know, I can understand why they are upset with us. People like you going over there to try to change their way of life. Oh, now y'all shouldn't have said that. I said, I'm sure glad you brought that up. Why don't you ever bring up that the fastest growing religion in this country is Islam? Why, why don't you bring up they're trying to change our culture? Why don't you ever bring this kind of mess up? I never hear that out of you. You're always pointed to us. Well, you, you send young people out there. You send them into that world. I don't send anybody. I said, I just help those God calls. He said, why would they go in the first place? I said, because they're under orders. I said, I was in the Marine Corps four years doing World War II. I, they never asked me where I wanted to go. They told me. Under orders. I said, you understand, I'm under orders. God called me. Oh, my. He don't believe that at all. He, you know, this, this, God, they don't wear God on their sleeves, you know. And he didn't want you to talk in this. I said, I'm a man under orders. They're a man under orders. To live or to die, our whole business is to carry this gospel to every creature. I don't believe there's ever been a greater opportunity I, our pastor said that yesterday as he was preaching. That I don't think there's ever been a greater opportunity. The harvest of the earth is come. I grew up on a farm part of my life, and you knew when the harvest was ready, it opened up. We grew cotton, and when that cotton opened up, you had to get it, or the bugs would, or the weather would. Something is going to get it once it gets ripe. Today multiplied millions are in that new age. They're open. They're looking. I told you when I was in Thailand, that woman kneeling before that Buddhist priest, 5.30 in the morning, out there to give an offering to that Buddhist priest. That so bothered me in trying, coming to that early morning prayer. I was praying. 
I, oh, I was troubled. I said, that woman kneeling, that, that demon-possessed priest, God said to me, that priest is devil-possessed. That's a devil religion, but she's not devil-possessed. She's looking for me. And the only reason she's bowing there, you have not told her who I am. How many people do you know in Ohio would get up at 5.30 in the morning and stand on the street corner to have an offering for God? That's where she was, standing on that street corner with an offering, looking for reality. It's a time when that spirit is open, we can reach them. It's an opportunity to be onwards. Very exciting day today. Come over here this morning, got here about a quarter to six. Amen. There was about four of us here. I walked around praying for about 10 minutes and knelt down. It says, believe. I said, I believe I'll make my altar there. And I knelt down, got lost in God, got up our, over a hundred of us here. I tell you, there was, there was, there was over a hundred folks. You get a hundred people out here at daylight to pray, you're about, you're about to have a revival. <laughs> it's easier to get 5,000 people at night than it is a hundred people before daylight to pray. And when you get that many people out to pray, then, then you know what a time we had. All of them went had breakfast together. Then we studied the Word of God for about three and a half hours. What a wonderful time. You know, we're going to repeat that in the morning and want to invite you to come and be with us. Two years painfully went through an awful time for God to say to me what I want to say to you and what I'm saying to them as we deal. The pathway to an overcoming life must begin with a born-again experience. It don't go anywhere except from there. But it must progress or it must die. You don't have to turn back. The Bible said darkness covers the earth. That means it's moving. All you have to do is stop and the darkness will overtake you. You have to continually move with God. So we want to give you an invitation to be with us in the morning all day, in the morning till noon. Breakfast, this wonderful church, the hospitality here is beyond words. Fed everybody here this morning. Breakfast, we went in, had all that wonderful time together, praying in the Word of God, then ate lunch, then went home. So you join us. I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 11 and Joshua chapter 19. I want to talk to you tonight. I just called it a double portion, a double portion talking about this life, this Holy Spirit, and what God has for you and I. I want to read from Luke chapter 11, number, first of all, verse 13. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? I want to just pause there just a minute to let you know what the word ask means. I've told you two or three times, but sometimes, you know, you have to repeat it a lot of time before it really registers in. The Bible said, ask of me, I'll give you the heathen for thine inheritance. For Jesus to ask meant he had to die. For you to have God's life, you got to die to yours. That's what it means by asking. He will not share his life with your life. People with two different wills cannot live in the same body. David could never get to that throne till Saul was gone. It's always that way. It has to be. One or the other has to go. No problem in Abraham's tent. Ishmael was 13 years old when Isaac was born. Everything was peaceful and wonderful until Isaac was born. Then flesh and spirit began the warfare. So to ask means for his life, you die to yours. In Joshua 19 and 50, according to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked, even Timnath Sirah in Mount Ephraim, and he built the city and dwelt therein. Father, anoint the preaching of the word of God tonight. Anoint us to hear. Fill us, every one of us, anew, afresh with this Holy Ghost tonight. Let this become the upper room for America. During this time, O oh wind of God, blow through this place. Blow up on us again in power, in fire, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
You know, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is not an experience of the imagination. There are a lot of folks who would like to make it that, but it's God's provision through the blood of Jesus for all of his believing Christians, all of those that believe God. The apostle Peter said that, that, that the, all that pertained to life and godliness was inside of the believer. Everything that you need is in this river of God that is coming to you by the Holy Spirit. All things, everything, whatever you need is in you. All God has ever needed was a man, and that's a generic term. All he's ever needed was a man, and all that man ever needed was the Holy Ghost. All he ever needed, all she ever needed was God. In every crisis of this world, God has only needed a man. When the bones were so dry that God even asked the question, Can these bones live? And the man of God said, Thou knowest God. Well, God said, If you've got enough faith to preach to them, they can live. I said, They can live. All he needed was a man with faith enough to preach to the dead, and the dead can come alive. Well, he began to prophesy. That's not just saying, thus saith the Lord, but he's preaching to those bones, dealing with them why they died. Well, in the first part of the message, bone began to come together, joint to joint. But he never mistook rattle for revival or commotion for unction. He knew better than that. He just kept preaching. There's a lot of racket. We forget it. We won't preach when there's a little jumping around. But he never was fooled by the rattle of those bones coming together. He preached on, so I prophesied again. Amen. Meat come on the bones. But what good is a skeleton? What good is a corpse? So he said, I prophesied again. That's all. No music. Wonderful choir. How that helps us to preach. But there's a lot of places we don't have this. So we must preach anyway. I said we must proclaim. We must believe that all we need anywhere on this planet is this Holy Ghost. He came in fulfillment of the promise of Christ to the disciples. All the works of Christ on this earth were wrought by the Holy Ghost. Acts 10, 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. It was the power of the Spirit which Christ worked his works. He was filled with the Holy Ghost when he come up out of the waters of Jordan. And from that moment, his life was continually, as a man, under the control of the Holy Spirit. Immediately, he was filled with the Holy Ghost in Matthew 3.16. Or Matthew 4 and 1, the Spirit led him into that wilderness. There where he met the devil. He overcome by the power of God in the Word of God. At the end, the Bible said, He went forth in the power of the Spirit I'm talking about. He went to Nazareth, climbed the pulpit steps to preach, and His first words were, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to preach the gospel, open the eyes of the blind, and to set the captive free. This is not optional. It's an absolute necessity for these demon-possessed days. It is given for this. All the works of Christ were this. For the disciples and the church, the witness to Christ and the resurrection, the life of Christ must actually be within us. It must be. It cannot. We learned this morning that the hell is not outside of that lost man. It's inside. Therefore, the Christ must come in. That's the only hope. He fell. He lost the image of God. And the only salvation is for that son to be born within him again. That son, a new birth of that son within him by the Holy Ghost. He came, so the Spirit came. He came with strange signs and wonders.
Jesus. He came with speaking through them in other tongues, demonstrating to the world that they had been possessed by the Spirit of God. Everything is under that control. They spake with other tongues as the Holy Ghost gave them the utterance. They were baptized in the Spirit and became His witnesses. Became His witnesses. Not talking. They became a witness. That just simply means the Holy Spirit in them made them the same witness that that tabernacle of witness was. There was no, it couldn't dance, couldn't sing, but every heathen knew that God lived within there. And if you and I are truly full of God, this world will know when we are around. You cannot allow God to possess your life without a world knowing that God's alive. He doesn't just make me a witness what I say. But he makes a witness because of what I am, a vessel of God, a vessel in which God lives and breathes. This is how he made them a witness. Amen. They were baptized, but it's a mistake to think that the Holy Spirit is only given to make me a witness. There's something wrought in the life of that believer by the baptism of the Holy Ghost that's as important every bit as important as witnesses. Something taking place inside of us when God comes into this temple. He only comes into the new creation. He never comes on anything or anybody but Christ. In, 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 the, in Corinthians, Paul said, by one spirit are we all baptized into Christ. Christ, the, the Holy Ghost baptizes us into Christ, but then Christ baptizes us in the Holy Ghost. And when that happens, when, when that whole, when Christ, uh, when we are put into Christ by the Holy Spirit, you understand, when we're put there, then we have come in to the reason for our being. Now God will baptize us, or Christ will, with the Holy Ghost, that we may be what He wants us to be, and that is His life lived through us on this planet. I read some time ago for the hundredth time where Paul said, I'm leaving. I've finished my course. I've done everything. No, no language can be changed. That meant every soul he's supposed to save, he's saved. Every message he's supposed to preach, he preached. Every devil he's supposed to cast out, he finished. I began to weep. I said to God, is it possible for a human like you and I to have the same testimony? Can I leave this earth? My God saying I've done it all. And the Holy Ghost said to me, if you let me be your life, it's impossible for you not to do it. But if I'm not your life, it's impossible for you to do what I tell you. You can't do this in the flesh. I said, this life can't be lived through, through human nature. Amen. Moses, you know, look, let's look at Israel. Coming out of the land of Egypt, they were providentially led and cared for all through that wilderness until they finally came to Canaan. What a miracle that was. Forty years, I crossed that desert in a bus. I made them stop. He stopped, what do you want? I said, I want to look around out here. For three million people nearly passed through this way. No Walmart. There's no J.C. Penny out here. But yet the shoes never wore out. Clothes grew with the body. The desert was filled with bread every morning. I said, I just want to have a look. How did they live out here? And I said, the second thing I want to look for is there's any tomb rocks out here. Everybody over 20 died. But not one marker out there there mister I said not one marker as I looked around God said to me no sir no I have no place for them they lost out they wouldn't cross the river but I kept them alive till the bread of generation will cross I'm telling you there's a generation under 60 living now that's going to cross that river oh hallelujah to God I said they're going to cross that river they're going into that land Yes, sir, there's been a generation that went. I, I, I can tell you, there have been those that stood. You've been one of them. 
amen, that stood for this truth. But many of them moved away from it. I said they moved away from it. But God made them breed a generation that says, I'm not walking that route. I'm going to seek out that old path. Wherein is the good way? I'm going to find my way back to this life and power of the Holy Ghost of God. Hallelujah. Moses, a type of the law, couldn't bring him in. I know that he hit that rock twice and his disobedience kept him out. But just the same, the Bible said, moreover, the law could not enter. Moses, a type of the law, couldn't take him over, but Joshua took him over into the land. Now Jordan was crossed, Jericho fell, Ai defeated, the kings of Gibeon were overthrown. At that point, the land was divided. Each tribe became responsible for the full possession of his own inheritance. At that point in time, now it's become the responsibility of the tribe. Listen to me. There's something worked in you by the Holy Spirit that will not be satisfied until all that God desires is fulfilled in your life. Did you know the uneasiness in your heart? Tonight, you're full of God, you walk with God, but yet there's an uneasiness, yet you look, there's no will for sin. That uneasiness is because of the, the dawning of that life in the uneasiness. Now, he's demanding to be the only light of your life. He's saying to you, I don't own you like I want to own you. I don't possess you like I want to possess you. But I am going to be the only light and power of your life. He come to be that. Now, at that point, they reached this state of victory because of their covenant relation to God by the blood of that Abrahamic covenant. Canaan represents a place of spiritual victory and life for the child of God. It's not heaven, we know that. But it is the kingdom of God. The Bible said if you find the kingdom, then everything else will be added. They, they had houses they didn't build, vineyards they didn't plant. They sought, they found the kingdom of God. That's a type. It's a place of the victory of their life. Now, Canaan, many found redemption through the blood, found the blessing, but are not satisfied. People in this room, there's something still missing. You know that. If you're not filled with, you know there's something missing in that life. Though you found the redemption of God, yet there's still something missing. They feel in their spirit there's much, still much land to be possessed. The apostle Peter said that Christ left us an example that we should follow in his steps. He came from heaven not to bring God down here, but to lift me up there. But he came to show me the pathway of how to get there. Three steps he left me. First of all, I must be born of the Spirit of God. Nobody's going anywhere with God until that new birth is a reality. And you don't grow into that. It's the greatest miracle ever come to this planet. But you must be. Christ, as a man, had to be born. Angels said to Mary, you're going to have a baby. She said, how can such a thing be? I've never known a man. She, and the angel answered that holy thing. In, in you is going to be the son of God. You're going to be overshadowed by this Holy Ghost. And that holy thing within you is going to be the son of God. Jesus was birthed of the spirit of God. He become a man through the process of the word of God. Now the Bible said you must be born of that spirit. The apostle Peter said we're born again. Not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God that lives and abide forever. And Paul said that seed was Christ. The same Holy Ghost that planted that seed in the heart of that virgin, in the, in the womb of that virgin, planted that same seed of Christ in my spirit. I become a new creature. That's the first step on this pathway. I said the first step on this pathway. The second step, Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost. When he come up out of that water, the dove came, the Holy Ghost came in the form of a dove. He came on us in the form of a fire because he had to burn a lot of trash up 
But there was nothing to burn up with Christ, so he come as a dove and stayed on him. He was baptized in the Holy Ghost. His ministry really began there when that Holy Spirit came on him. I said his ministry really began when he was filled with the Holy Spirit. What he's saying to you, this is the path. This is the step. Third, he had to be led. He was led every moment by the Spirit. It is learning to live by this life is the, is the life work of the Christian. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, the only will of God for you. He don't want you to preach. He don't want you to do anything but be born again. And if you're here tonight born of the Spirit of God, then the whole will of God for your life is to fill you with the Holy Ghost. They never even let a man serve tables didn't have his Holy Ghost. Because he knew, he knew if he let them out there without this Holy Ghost, they're going to have favorites among them with us and we're going to have trouble. But a man full of the Holy Ghost and faith ain't going to treat the Greek any different than does the Jew or the Jew any different than the Greek. Amen. There's no partiality. Amen. There's no respect to persons where God is in control. You don't say to the poor man, stand over there and the rich man sit here. There is no respect to person. So everything in that house had to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Man, going to walk going to mow that yard out there ought to be full of the faith in the Holy Ghost. That's, that's the will of God for every single human being. Now that's the will of God. If you've been born again and not filled, He's not calling you to go anywhere until God fills you with the Holy Spirit. He's not the helper, He's the life. But if you're full, then the lifelong process is learning the leadership of that Holy Spirit. Learn it to walk with Him. Amen. If you don't learn the leadership, then He's going to have to drop you out along this way. He's going to have to drop you out because there's no place for the flesh here. You have to learn. You know, I pastored for 35 years. Amen. I, I had nobody teach me anything. I learned the hard way. Run a lot of folks off. Hurt a lot of people. All honestly, I walked on them, said things. But just the same, in the process, that you know God's laboratory is the wilderness. Amen. He took them out there where the sand's hot. That was a laboratory to teach them. I heard a man preach on that last week and sure stirred up my soul. But you know, I, 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 I learned this, this leadership of the Holy Spirit, that you've got to learn to live with this life. You can't have him in you and ignore him. That's ungodliness. To have God living on the inside of you, then walk after the flesh. Ungodliness is to disregard God. And for God to live on the inside of me and me not give him the time of day is a crime of all crimes. Is that right? Think about him living. So I knew and I preached, you got to learn to be led by the Spirit of God. Well, through trial and error, I learned that this is not a nervous twitch, not a slack jaw. It simply begins with the Word of God. I read this book. I put it into practice in my life. This book was written to saints. has very little to say to sinners. I learned that this is not legalism, folks. You hear me. We've got the cry of legalism everywhere. I know what legalism is. If I think I'm saved because I don't cuss anymore, that's legalism. But if I don't cuss because I'm saved, that's a walk in the Spirit of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I said that's a walk in the Spirit of God. But I learned the leadership begins with this book. I read this book. It says men ought always to pray and not faint. Brother picked me up this morning. I said I woke up my right mind. How do you know? Wanted to go to that prayer meeting. Oh, yes, sir. Wanted to go to that prayer meeting. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of God. I don't wake up on a Sunday and say I've got to go to church. I wake up on a Saturday and say I wish it was Sunday. Oh, hallelujah to God. Oh, yes, sir. The leadership began. Men ought always to pray. On our way to this prayer meeting this morning, I knew as well as I know my name 
name. I am being led by the Spirit of God. The Bible says to me, bring all your tithe into the storehouse. Not to the evangelist, not to your poor kin folks, but into this church, into that storehouse. I've been for 55 years. Now about 60% of what comes to us, me and mama bring to that storehouse. All I'm telling you, I know when I drop that in there, I'm being led by the Spirit of God. I said, I'm being led. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourself together. When I head for the house of God, I'm being led by the Spirit of God. And if you learn to obey the Word of God, then there's a sensitivity where God can talk to you. That's what the Bible says that Clinton is supposed to start a Bible school. But I know I was born for that. I was 70 years old when I moved to Russia. Amen. Every new move is a very difficult one. I quit a great job to go preach. Had no place to go. I just knew I had to leave. That was one of the most difficult times at, at that point. Three years later, God told me to start the church in Beaumont. Had no sponsor. Never been in the city in my life. Had nobody there. Had nothing. I, many times we had a hamburger to spit four ways with that family, but it was a difficult thing to cancel those those revivals and move to that city and begin that church, but I did. And then it's 70. He said, you resigned this church, and you and your wife moved to Russia. Well, you know, you're old enough to be dead about that time, and it is the easy thing just to pick up and go. But I remember I found my place 10 years early in Moses. He is 80 before he got there. See, I, I have nowhere in the Bible says that I'm supposed to move there, but I knew that. It's simply because I obeyed the written Word of God. I'm talking about God's pathway born, I feel with, led by that Holy Spirit. Amen. This, this, this is God's way, only God's way. You have to be filled with Him to be led by Him. Well, I, I don't know. I don't think you have this kind of people in Ohio. But I can tell you in Texas, we had some folks. They never bought a songbook, but they wanted them there. They never bought a pew, but they always sat on them. Never give a quarter, but mad if the air condition went off. You can believe that. Amen. Well, they'd come in, never come to a prayer meeting, never come Wednesday night or Sunday night, but come tiptoeing in there on Sunday morning wanting to prophesy to me. I said, just sit down, please. You say, that's me. No, no, that ain't me. You don't obey this book. They didn't pay no time. You don't obey this. Don't talk to me. God's trying to talk to you. Ain't nobody talking to you but you. Don't come up here with no prophecy if you won't even go to church. Don't come up here with no tongue to me if you won't pay your tithe into the pastor in the church. I said, just sit down out there. Well, some of them left. They ought to left. If they're not going to get into the thing, one of the greatest men of God ever knew in my life, J.C. Hibbert of Dallas, Texas. We were just like that. We were the greatest of friends. He preached for me, I for him. He had a church about like this, in total Pentecostal, several hundreds of people. I just sat in there when he was with me, 200 people just getting started. I said to him, Brother Hibbert, what is the secret of building a great church other than fasting, praying, preaching? He said, knowing who not let to stay there. Wow, <laughs> what a gospel. John said they left us, they wasn't of us. They wasn't of us. I'm, I'm talking about Jesus come to show us the way. Oh, hallelujah. They feel in their heart, those that have been birthed, there's much land to be possessed. And that possession is to be filled with the Spirit and ultimately led by. Their victory is not complete because they've not been filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, stopping short of God's best was the besetting sin of Israel, and that sin is still around today. The church is full of dead people that still are religious, but they're dead because they wouldn't grow. Amen. Everything that has life has to grow or it must die. 
Amen. Last year in our school, we had this pretty little couple here. Amen. Not so pretty she is, but that she was pregnant, sick the whole time. I prayed for her every morning. Now look at that beautiful baby. Amen. That little girl. But she wasn't born to be a baby. She's born to be like her mother. Amen. If she don't grow, she can't live. It has to be a growth the same true naturally as true spiritually. You can't just sit on the church pew. You have to grow or die. has to be that growth. And that growth has to follow the pattern. You've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joshua did not sin. He did not return to Egypt. Amen. Joshua wanted more than he had ever experienced. When an end was made of dividing the land, Joshua asked for his own personal inheritance. Amen. He asked for his own personal. They gave him Timnath Sirah. Think of that now. There are three things we need to note about Joshua's inheritance. Three things, because this is where we are. Our inheritance is this Holy Ghost. As believers, God put everything in the new creature except the inspiration. He cannot inspire himself, and the Holy Ghost is a gift of God. I said it's a gift of God to the new creature. And so they gave him Tim the Sarah. Here, listen, number one, it was given to him according to the word of God. Number two, he had to ask for it. And number three, he had to take it. Now, if you think the devil's going to play dead while you get full of this that's going to spell his life, he's not afraid of anything but life. Mark that down. I said he's afraid of nothing but life. Job's the richest man in the east. Amen. Here come the devil said to God. Uh, or God said to him, what do you think of Job? Well, he said, he said, you got a hedge around if you pull it down. He did. Killed all his cows, all his kids. Come back and said, just let me touch him. Anything but kill him. God said you can't kill him. You can't kill a church. It has to commit suicide. Amen. Ain't no way in the world man, this world can kill a church. Amen. Well, the, the devil, see, is out there now with boils all over him, scraping himself with broken pottery, a poor man, everything is gone, but he's as much a terror to hell as he ever was. The devil got in his wife said, why don't you get to kill himself? Tell him to curse God and die, because it was a life in Job, you understand. It's the life. I said, it's the life. It, the growth comes out of the life, but the life is what God must have. Multiplying the tares just prop multiplies the problem. Amen. You, we've got to bring new creatures, fill them with the Holy Ghost, bring them in. He had, he had to, had to take it. I don't know when the Lord told Joshua he could have the city for his own, but somewhere during that, that crusade of taking it, he saw it, he asked, and God said he could have it. God has promised you and me the spiritual counterpart of Tim the Sira, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, is according to the Word of God. That is the counterpart of that Tim the Sira. I'll show you in a minute. I will not leave you comfortless. I'll come to you, Jesus said. That's the baptism. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I go away, I'll send him unto you. John 16 and 7. You shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. It was according to the word of God. That, that has to be. Second, amen, the disciples had to ask for it. I said they had to ask. They were daily in the temple blessing and praising God. Now I know, I know that he's already come, but I know he hadn't come in to a lot of you. Amen. There's a lot of us in this building he hadn't come in to, and if you want him to come, you're going to have to invite him in. You go to the 36th chapter, uh, I believe it is, of the book of Ezekiel, and begin with about the 22nd verse, read all the way down to 37, and God says to Israel, I will put at you a new heart, I will bless you, I'll keep you, I'll guide you, I will, I will. Fifteen times it said I will. You think that's enough, but Israel never got it. And the 37th verse said, why? They never asked him. They never inquired. You're never going to get this Holy Ghost unless you ask. 
You can come tuck your head under there and hope something's going to fall on you. But if you'll throw them hands up and say, I want this. Amen. I want it. You can't, if you could perfect yourself without it, wouldn't be no need to have it. Amen. It isn't for per- 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 perfect people. It's to perfect people. Amen. He comes. The moment you are born again, you become that temple and God would want you to feel for you got up out of that altar. Amen. The disciples had to ask for it daily in the temple, blessing, praising God. These all continued one accord, prayer and supplication. That means asking. They had the promise but they waited on God in prayer and supplication until that promise was fulfilled. Their multitudes would be fulfilled, would be filled if you'll only follow the pattern. They know the word on the subject. They see the experiences one to be desired, yet they remain outside of their inheritance. Shake yourself. Ask for it. Seek after it. Like the heart after that water brook. Let God deal with you to where you know you cannot live without this experience. Ask for it. Believe God. Rise up. Cry out to God. There's an actual receiving of the Holy Ghost by faith. They were saved by faith, healed by faith. We overcome by faith. Paul tells them to receive the Holy Ghost by faith. Receive you the Spirit by the hearing of the law or by the hearing of faith. There must come the time when desire becomes determination and determination becomes desperation. He don't feel the lazy. You've got to be hungry. They that hunger and thirst. Every Jacob will finally get to Peniel. May take a while. I said may take a while. God to deal with all that carnality. But if that hunger is there, he will get to Peniel. Amen. He'll get there. In the desperation of hunger for God, then it's then complete surrender is given. Whatever you have to do, just fill me. Amen. It's in that desperation to have God to come and occupy this temple that complete surrender is given to God. Amen. In that moment, faith takes hold of the promise. Now, I look at Joshua's experience. We reveal a striking picture of the experience is for all who pay the price. The word timnasira is derived from two root words, according to Strong, meaning a double portion. That means, that's, that's the meaning of the word timnasira, a double portion. Coming from those root words, it means that. Now, the, the word also implies the portion of the remainder, meaning there's more for all of us. I said more for all of us. Example, when the leper was cleansed by the application of blood on his ear, his thumb, and his toe, then the priest took oil and put on that blood. You, but they, not just the blood, but the oil, the Holy Ghost. Amen. He put on the oil, on the ear, on the thumb, and on the toe. Then he poured the remainder, all the remaining portion, he poured it on his head. That's what we must see. The rest of that oil is our portion. We must see that. This is what God is saying to us. The rest of that oil. The double portion was the right of the firstborn in Israel. I said the right of the firstborn. When Elijah was about to be translated. You remember the old man came up behind him. God told him in that cave. said you go down. You anoint this man to be prophet in your room. You're going to be going home someday. And I want you to anoint him. Well he went down. Come up behind him. Plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, the old man come by, passed that mantle on him. He dropped those plow lines, ran after him, said, let me go tell mom and dad by, I'm going with you. The old man said, what have I to do with you? If you can be discouraged, you're going to be discouraged. If you can be knocked out, you're as good as gone. Everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken in these final times. What have I got to do with you? He went back, slaughtered the oxen, barbecued them with a plow, and set out after him. Edgar Bethany said he followed him eight years. Bill Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho. Then across the Jordan. Got across the Jordan. Hardly talked to him, looked like. Everywhere he went, they tried to say, you stay here. You know he's going to be took up. Not on your life. Where he goes, I'm a-going. When they got on the other side, the old man said to him, what do you want out of me? You've been a shadow for eight years. I want a double portion of what I felt back yonder. 
Yes, sir, I felt something that cotton patch. When you passed that mantle over me, I want a double portion of what happened. You see, everybody has a right to seek God after reality. God wants you to know that God is real. He don't want you going on a theory. This God is real. You can know this God. You can know him personally. He'll walk with you every day. He'll be the life of your life if you'll let him. Amen. But he, he went. What he said was, when he said, let me a double portion of thy spirit, what he actually said was, count me as your very own son, adopt me as your offspring and firstborn, so I shall inherit the right of the firstborn. A double portion of what you got. I don't want your farm. I want what I felt. I want this Holy Ghost. He said, adopt me. Now we are the sons of God. We're members of the firstborn. The right of the firstborn, the double portion, is our inheritance. It isn't something we have to beg God for. That's the inheritance. We have the rights of the firstborn, and a double portion is ours from God. I challenge you, rise up and claim tonight in this altar what is yours. You must know as you move to claim this great truth that there's an enemy who opposes such claims. There is a devil. If he can't get you to stop seeking, he'll sell you short. He'll make you believe, get you after a prayer language. You're going to get that prayer language, but you're not going to get it till you get the Holy Ghost. Amen. He gives the prayer language. It isn't the prayer language you need. You need the Holy Ghost. I said, you need the Holy Ghost. I spent seven years in Vietnam. John Kerry spent four months. I spent seven years out there. I saw more of the war than he did, I'll tell you that. Amen. I found some of the finest men. They weren't rapists. They weren't murderers. They're the finest people this nation ever put out there. Amen. I saw, listen, I, I saw out there in that world, in that world, uh, the necessity People come out to help me. Amen. People come out to help me. Different ones. Well, a man came out one night, and he, one time rather, and I let him preach that first night. Instead of preaching on the Holy Ghost, he spoke, he preached on tongues. He had got about 10 minutes, and I saw where he was going. I got up and set him down. He died angry at me, but Pastor. But I, I said to him, I said, they don't need tongues. That comes with this. They've been in war 25 years. You can play your game over there, but you can't play them out here. It's hell out here, mister. I said, it's hell. They've been in a war 25 years. They need the Holy Ghost. They need God to live in them. They don't need to be able to say Coca-Cola real fast. They need God to mighty to fill them with the Holy Ghost. I got to, I got to that world. I got a meeting in, in one of those dead, one of those churches. Pastors back there 14 years ago, they left him for dead in North Korea. I, I mean, in North, North Vietnam. They, they, and they had a big hole in his head. And as I sat there talking to him, he said, I, you got to know up front, preacher, I'm a drug addict. He said, I, I, not by choice, but I've had a headache for 14 years, no drugs. I'm taking the strongest. No drug can kill it. God said to me, lay hands on him. I laid hands on him. He healed at 14 years instantaneously. He was born again at that desk. I said he had born again at that desk. I, 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 only, only other saved person I'd build, my wife. I'm telling you, Hades wasn't six foot from where we were. It was hot in Saigon. <laughs> Amen. That building had no air and these little ceiling fans. My wife, the only saved person in there besides me, but now the pastor's saved. When we walked out of his office, I looked in the left. Men were sitting here, and they were talking. An old man, an old man, and he looked up and saw me begin to weep. Just begin to weep. The service ran for three hours. Everybody wanted to get saved. Then had to pray for all the sick. Nobody leaves till the pastor's at the door. He never quit crying. Well, at the door, I'm in the line. He's coming. I said to Con, my interpreter, tell me why he's crying. When he got there, I said, sir, you, 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 you began crying when I walked out. You haven't stopped. What happened? He said, five years ago, like Hannah, he's 85 years old, I found. Five years ago, like Hannah, I was weeping. Oh, my 
God, send a revival to this troubled land. And God said to me, you'll not die until you see the man that will bring that revival. And said, when you walked out, God said, look closely. That's the man. I saw Pentecost come. I saw Pentecost come for the first time in 4,000 years of history. And the greatest school is there tonight. Persecuted, hounded, hated. But there's tens of thousands of Holy Ghost filled believers. Because I was full, I could give it to them. Yes, sir. He said, I'm going to give you something if you'll give it away. Amen. That, that crippled man sitting there, Peter, come and met up a room. Amen. Been there, had that little old cup sitting out there. He said, put that down, son. I don't have no money. But what I got won't fit that cup. I'll tell you that. Oh, no. It won't fit that cup. I'm, oh, my God. God. Well, glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, yes, it put that down. I don't have no money, but what I'm going to give you won't, won't fit in that little cup. I've got something going to reach around. I said going to reach around this world. Blessed be his wonderful name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, we must not be deceived into believing that we can claim this double portion without meeting that devil. Samson is a great example of Satan's opposition and God's provision for defeating both of them in this life. Listen to this. Samson was separated as a Nazarite under God and the Lord was seeking to arouse him into action against the Philistines. Moving in the will of God, Samson went down to visit a young woman who he sought to be his wife. Now, then went Samson down, Judges 14, 5, then went Samson down to Timnath, there's a word, and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. Now, when he drew near the vineyards of Timnath, a lion came out to destroy him. Now, you know in the Bible, a vineyard stands for fruitfulness and for spiritual life and blessings. It's when Samson drew near to Timnath, the double portion, I mean, when he drew near to, to that place of the double portion, that Satan comes snacking, growling, screaming in an effort to destroy it. When he approached that place of the double portion, all hell had to throw come against him now. Because he doesn't care how much religious you are unless you're moved out against him. Unless in the fire of this spirit you rise up to challenge what's going on. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he rent him as he went with a kid and he had nothing in his hand. As, as Samson stood there in utter helplessness, the spirit of God came upon him. So it is with our conflict. Our weapons are not carnal. You can be sure that when you draw nigh to this double portion, that roaring lion is going to come against you. But it's there that the Spirit of God will raise up that standard. He'll raise up against him. Now, there are three re weapons I want to suggest to you which we can stand and defeat him and be filled. First is the blood of Jesus. Our, our pastor talked so elegantly yesterday morning about that. He dealt with that blood, with that, with that Calvary, with that cross where Christ died. That blood secures the ground. If I stand where I belong, Satan's got to wade through that blood to get where I am. Amen. If I just stand in that place, that's the first weapon against that enemy. He opposes, listen, everything. He opposes our salvation, our healing, every victory we have, but the devil cannot penetrate that blood. Amen. The second weapon is, is the weapon of faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Stand on the promise. Look, folks, quote them, read them, sing them, claim them. I found this in the early. I first got saved. I knew there's nothing in me. I didn't, I couldn't quote John 3.16. But I sell that all. That, that, that man picked me up every morning by seven. 
I got up around 5.30. I memorized a chapter in the Bible every single morning. I'd quote it all day long. I remember the time I got to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. I quoted those 40 verses 50 times. And I, one time I thought, me and that tractor both are going to get out of here. Oh, such a victory, such a power. Quote them, sing them, memorize them. Fill your heart with the Word of God. The Word hid in your heart will keep you from sinning against God. There's no weapon like the weapon of the Word of God. Then the third, we have the weapon of praise. Oh, hallelujah. There's a spiritual fortitude that comes through praise that nullifies the attack of an enemy. Most people who've reached him, the Sarah, got there through the gates of praise. Hallelujah. They got altar and they begin to praise they worship they thanked him they laid a hold of god most of them that got to that double portion got there through those gates of praise praise honors the word magnifies the power of the blood cripples and routs the demon forces oh that men would praise the lord oh that men would praise the lord god wants to fill Every one of us. I was in that hotel room this scene. Oh, God, let this be the upper room for America. Let that wind blow one more time with such power that they'll be coming from downtown hollering what meaneth this, that God would be so real, so wonderful. See, we've made him a little bit of nothing. I was in a hotel room a lot of years ago where they're having a full gospel businessman and I'm quitting right here, and we're going to seek this Holy Ghost. But I was in that meeting, and I, 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 we went, a man preached, and he dealt with all you got to do is say it's done, and it will be done. Well, he went on and on, and all the time he had seen it had been one of those meals, and now the waitress is in there picking up cups and saucers while, while all this is going on. And, and you just hear the plates are rattling. And finally he said, now I want, you to, I want you to obey what I tell you. I want everybody here that's got diabetes stand up. Well, uh, they, they stood up. There's 400 is there. He said, there's, he said there's 20 people here with it. Well, insurance says one in every 20 has got it. Amen. That's the way it is. You had no trouble with that. One in every 200 is going to go blind or something like that. You know, you can just get it all. That's all it was. It's so dead. That, that gift worked 10 times in 20 minutes, and they never even quit picking up the dishes. I said to the man next to me, my God, this thing fell in Jerusalem, and the city shut down. <laughs> Paul cast the devil out of a girl in Philippi, and they locked him up and beat him half to death. Peter healed a crippled man at the gate. Beautiful crowd come, 5,000 people got saved. I tell you, if that Holy Ghost come through here and the real gift of God operate 10 times, they'll shut them down on that freeway. Why don't men praise God? Why don't you stand with us? Why don't you stand and let's love him here tonight? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, why don't men praise the Lord? Why don't we praise the Lord? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, tonight, listen to me. This, this, this great choir is going to come, and we're going to worship. But I want everybody in this house that's never been filled with the Holy Ghost, I want you to come, and I want you to stand far enough out so that we can get in front of you and get behind you. But I want you to come and lift up those hands and ask God to fill you with the Holy Ghost and then begin to praise, begin to worship Him. You've got to ask. I said you've got to ask if you're going to get it. You ask, you believe. And I want every one of you, listen, every one of you that's not been filled, just come right on. Don't hesitate. Amen. Now keep Him where we can get in front of Him, sir. Amen. Just come line up right along there. Come on, folks. Come on down. You lift up them hands. Begin to worship this God. You folks over here, come right here. Amen. Come on down. You lift them hands and begin to love this great God. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be. Come on, folks. Just come along. 
need get along here fill in the gaps just stand here lift those hands that's right young men God bless you this is a moment of all moments this Tim Nasira hallelujah to God I'd like for I'd like for all of those full of the Holy Ghost now you folks out there come get behind them amen you you ministers of the gospel you'd come help us get in front of them let's lay hands on them here tonight begin to worship begin to praise begin to expect hallelujah 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 come on down folks all of you come help us here help us here tonight help us here tonight everybody to fill every one of us Yeah.